Hey, Stacy. Oh, interesting. I'm not hearing you. Oh, you're uh, now you're connected. Hi. How are you? I'm pretty well, thank you. And yourself? I'm well. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So many things moving all at the same time. It's funky. I kind of like it. Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's a. Uh, it beats doing the same predictable thing every day. Yeah. I had a, I had a dinner with David Allen years ago. He's the getting things done guy who wrote the book. Uh -huh. And he was trying to figure out how to like build a business model that would give him escape velocity enough to be able to step away from the business and retire. But try as he might, everything he was doing, he was selling books, he was selling workshops. He had merch, he had coaches on the phone to help people, you know, talk people through how to get things done. I'm forgetting one or two other business models sort of all there, he had a staff, they were quite efficient. Obviously he was getting things done. Um, but but he, one of the things he said that stuck in my head was he, was he was performing the same one day workshop like 200 days a year mm -hmm. in which he had to show up with energy. And, if, and it, because it was David Allen's getting things done, if he didn't show up at the front of the room, like people didn't sign up. Yeah. So he couldn't offload it. He had kind of made the mistake of, of sort of connecting his person with his brand. Um, and I, I, you know, we brainstormed and I don't know how, he's, how it's gone. I haven't talked to him since, but I was like, wow, like, like to have, to, have, to have come up with a bunch of good things that spark a bunch of people into productive work is awesome. And then to be trapped in the model is not fun. I haven't read the book, so, but I'm just, so, he came up with a model for other people to get things done. Including and him. And, and including him. Yeah. But he's trapped by the business model of trying to, you know, break free from, from the same sort of stuff. Uh, and, and his model is easy to explain. So getting things done roughly says, in your head are a whole bunch of things he calls open loops, which is stuff I know that I got to get done. It's in the back of my head. And you keep, you hold a lot of these things. These are like... These are the, the you get your to do things, and your life will be better if you can get all of these open loops out of your out of your head, and into a reliable system that you will check on all the time. Okay. That's the key: is that you have to get them into a system that you're going to just work from. And then he shows you how to break things down into tasks instead of big projects. Uh, and then he gives you a sort of priorities, like any task you can do in under two minutes, just go do it. Uh, and then a bunch of other ways. And I'm sure that the whole model has evolved a, a lot. Um, and then some to-do list applications sort of tune themselves to this model because it's really, it, it lends itself really nicely to, you know, to-do list prioritization and whatnot. Um, so it's cool. It's, 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 you know, it's cool as a way to get things done. Um, and then, then, then what, right? Well, I guess the piece that's missing for me is What's the motivational piece of it? Like some things you have to get done and then there's those things that you want to do. And so what forces you back to doing those things? Um, exactly. And then like, what's a priority and what's not? Uh, I mean, all those questions are, are, are big questions. And I'm just wondering if we're in the right room or whatnot. I'm checking to see if anybody's messaging us and nobody yet. So I think we're in the right place. <laughs> to just pivot a little bit because yeah. this is another thing so you know in OGM there's not a lot of like venture capitalists or people that are constantly thinking about money right. which is almost a shame in it in the reverse way because we're using old business models that, that like I don't see a sustainable business model for the small guy like, I don't see the system where the money's, be, like when you were talking about the commons and OGM. And I mean, I, I again, when you talk about the commons, I'm, I could be wrong. This is like um, like a metaphor, right? There's not an actual entity. That... Not one, well, it's like the internet is not one entity, right? Okay. And the, so there's old commons and new commons. The old commons are things like aquifers and fisheries and forests and healthy soil and clean air. Those are all commons. Uh, and, the, and the prototypical one is the, the village green where people graze their sheep, right? Uh, and if you have too many sheep on the commons, you overgraze. There's the tragedy of the commons, which is like a, a bad meme, actually. Uh, 
And so the new commons are the information commons and their dynamics are different because if I, if I copy some open source code over to my hard drive, the open source code that exists in the world is not diminished at all. And in fact, you could argue it's improved because if I looked at the code and said, ah, here's a fix and I submitted a fix, then that open source code just got more productive, got more powerful, got more secure, got more something because of my, my easy participation. So, so the new commons or information commons, and there's many of them, but it's like, it's like kind of anywhere there's a disk drive that is open for access is kind of part of the new commons, I think. Um, and there's some major bodies of work in the new commons. So the Wikipedia, which uses open source code called Wikimedia as its engine for building a wiki, has data that you could take, you know, somebody published a German Wikipedia dictionary, I think somewhere. You know, and that's totally like up to anybody to do. You can go do that. Um, and so there's, and there's hundreds of foundations, each of which is holding like the Apache foundation is where Apache software lives, Linux foundation, Mozilla foundation, you name it. And those are all part of the commons. And then there's data commons, which are big databases, big pools of data that are shared, shareable, buildable, all those kinds of things. And then there's other kinds of commons kind of in this space that would have to do with ideas, pattern languages, you know, higher level stuff than, than just a, a, bucket of, uh, a bucket of data. And all of that is in the commons. Okay, but, there, so the, but there's no, so there's no funding of the commons because there's no entity to fund, like when I think of like PBS, you know, and you know, they take donations, there's none of that. So there is a bunch of that because each of the foundations I've just mentioned raises funds so that they can have staff so that they can actually take care of these things. Uh, and and a, a model I really like. So when Linux first comes out, uh, Linux is a, a, an open source version of Unix, which was an, uh, an invention of AT&T's Bell Laboratories a long time ago and has a long and twisty history. Um, but at some point, this, this guy named Linus Torvald says, I would like to have a version of, of, of Unix that runs on my PC. Would anybody like to join me? That's his, that's his plausible promise. And then people join and suddenly they, they create this thing called Linux, which then runs on just about anything. You can kind of move Linux to anything. And then um, a series of vendors show up who make a living selling Linux distributions, they're called, which is we've taken Linux, it's exactly the same Linux, and we've piled on it a bunch of utilities and we've made it work in this kind of environment or especially for these kinds of applications. And they made a good living. There are a whole bunch of those distributions. Some of those companies are still around. And those were for-profit businesses who, a piece of whose task it was to make sure that Linux and whatever other pieces of open source software they were using just kept getting better. Otherwise their competitive advantage goes away, right? Um, so, so they would devote some of their paid staff to helping make sure Linux was, was, was improving for everybody. And that's different because before, like each company would have its own software and not worry about anybody else. Okay, but no, but no money gets funneled back to the original people that jumped on to make it better in the first place. Um, depends. I mean, what happens a lot is that the inventors of things wind up figuring out what other role they want to play or or they, they apply for grants. I mean, a, a lot of these people formed up foundations and became the heads of the foundations. Uh, and then received grant money and take a salary from the grants. Yeah. And then but, you that's see, fine. but you see what happens. You see what happens in real life, like just like watching these calls. Once the whole idea of money and profit gets into the mix, people get really tense and uptight. And will they? Will they? Be, do you know what I'm what I'm trying to say? Sure. There's, I mean, it, I guess I was. I guess I was wondering if there was like a hybrid type where you like unionize and form a cooperative but where there's a, a real mechanism that you know some of it is gonna come back into the cooperative and members of the, that cooperative will actually get like a dividend almost. Um, so yes, there's a whole bunch of ways of setting these things up, uh, including co-ops, including now DAOs, digital autonomous, uh, decentralized autonomous uh, organizations and a bunch of other things. So I think, I think your question is great, and and um, uh, I think other people would probably know better than I what the alternatives are and and other ways of doing all this. Yeah, I thought a lot about DAOs, and I mean, I I actually started charting something, but I I wanted to ask you that because I wasn't sure if there was actually like the other question I had is 
why couldn't what you're doing when you're talking about making money, why couldn't that be a for-profit entity with a different arm well, that which, was- Which part do you mean? Your, your, your um, I guess it was designed from trust or- Yeah, your... so what I'm envisioning, I mean, there's lots of different models to do this. I, I used to do a lot of work with the Institute for the Future, which is a nonprofit that was set up like 40 years ago. And they pay salaries, they, you know, they, they chug along, uh, and they're a nonprofit. Um, what I was envisioning was a for benefit of some sort that would be a consultancy that might be a co-op, might be a, 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 an LLC or something else, uh, but would, help, would probably need one of those kinds of formal structure um, that would live atop the OGM kind of uh, commons or, or, or uh, ecosystem or whatever else you want to call it. And, and my wish is that the things that are created in Design From Trust as a consultancy are as much as possible fed back into the commons. That you know, when, when we, they invent the new process, that they're like, here's how the process works, and boom, they create a pattern language or a process or something and say, here, everybody else, uh, try, you know, you're welcome to use it and, and improve it. And if you improve it and put it back here, uh, we will add your improvements and say, thank you. Yeah, and I, I was wondering if the consultancy could be a benefit for people working in the commons, whereas if they're not part of the commons, they pay high price. So one of the interesting things to do, one interesting business model, one that I like a lot, is you pay for privacy. So as long as you're willing to keep your work open and share it out, you pay nothing for using the platform. The moment you want to have privacy and you want to make it yours, then you pay good money because the software is pretty good and you do it yourself. And I, I don't know whether GitHub works that way. I don't know whether SourceForge worked that way, but I think so, where these were these were places where uh, people put open source code you know, for programs. Um, and GitHub kind of killed SourceForge because it had a different form of improving software. It had a different uh, format for doing so. Um, but, um, but I think it's I think that's a really nice business model because some people definitely want privacy and they don't really want to play in the commons, but they their work should their use of the tools should subsidize um, other people's work in the commons totally. Yeah. And it's a way to shift where you're drawing money from, from, you know, you know, you're, you're pulling from the top instead of pulling from the bottom. Exactly, exactly. But I know you might have more better things to do. I don't know what you want to no, do. No, no, I'm here for the Thursday call oh. and I'm just looking to make sure that that um, we're not in the wrong place or something like that. And I think we're in the right place. So it is what it is. One of those days. And I'm happy. I'm, you always ask good questions and you're, you're helping take us in the right direction. So uh, happy to talk about these things. Well, that's all I got. <laughs> um, so there, there's some questions about like what does OGME mean, which which I'd love to just start talking about if you're up if you're up for that conversation. Sure. Yeah. Um, and part of the problem is that OGM is this big squishy vision uh, that includes things like the geeky stuff we were just talking about. Uh, in particular, an emphasis I think on mapping, visualization, argumentation, uh, things like that, but also then storytelling, which is different which is not you know, the same as argumentation or visualization. It is a form of visualization, I guess, too. Um, and there's this whole layer of like tools to do those things. But then OGM also cares about like just the nature of discourse and trust. And the fact that if we can't actually sit down with each other, there's no use for these tools of fancy visualization or even, or even nurturing trustworthy data. Because if nobody's gonna pay attention to the data, we're all sunk, right? Yeah. And, and so, so I think behaving in an OGME way or doing OGME things means uh, nurturing the commons means, um, and, I, and this is the part we haven't done very much of, which is why it's sort of maybe mysterious or maybe not, not set down much, but, but when we start saying things and making claims and making arguments and stuff like that, to actually model them and to actually find why did we say this? And, and you know, how does that all fit together to use the tools that we're talking about for the conversations that we're having? By which I don't mean that we should endlessly unpack every phrase that we say, which if, if taken to the extreme, that's, what it, that's where it goes to, right? It's like, it's like somebody makes a, 
a passing comment and it gets analyzed and cataloged and whatever. But how do we take like the shiny little nuggets uh, that show up in conversation and pull them out? And also um, the moments of tension or the moments of, of really interesting questions that came up. So um, last Thursday, we had some conversation around um, there hasn't been enough research done on the effects of COVID uh, and the vaccines and all that kind of stuff. We had a, we had a, like a couple moments during last week's call that I was interested in revisiting this week. Um, and part of that, I think, is slowing down the process of conversation, which we don't do enough of here. And then part of it is unpacking, or maybe Adam Grant would say complexifying the issue, which means that's the great question. The question isn't binary. It's actually pretty like, <clears throat> it has a lot of layers to it. Let's see if we can't agree on what the layers of the question are. And then let's see, <clears throat> excuse me, if we can't figure out where those layers fit and how they work together. So that kind of thing. Um, and let me pause for a second and see if that's making sense. Yeah, no, it's absolutely making sense. I, I think that, <laughs> excuse me for one second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, it, do, it does make sense. The problem is that the examples that come up are so charged, and it would be nice if we could take topics that aren't as charged and run them through the same model, then go back to the topic that's charged. It would be good. I'd love that. Um, um... And as practice rounds, we could actually sort of sit and do that. So we could we could set aside a, a different call and pick a pick a neutral topic and 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 practice that a couple of times. I think that'd be real, actually super useful. Um, in in practice, what ends up happening is somebody asks a really hard question, and then you've got the hard question in front of you, and some and maybe the only way through that question, past that question, is through that question, and to do the process with the hard question. I don't know. And you know, hard questions bring emotions to bear and make people really present and sometimes lead to a lot of strife and sometimes um, like lead to resolution. But like even shifting the topic from vaccinations to a different drug. Right. That could be the difference right there because I don't, I mean, I understand the point. There are, we do, I know myself, when I start to hear people talking about anything that sounds like a reason not to get a vaccination, the wall goes up a little bit. Yeah. But, there, but there is some validity there, but it would be easier to show a different drug first because then you could say, okay, how much emphasis do we put on this? How much emphasis do we put on the risks of this? Let's right. apply that same emphasis now we can continue the conversation. Or maybe we need to step outside of medicine altogether and practice in a different theme because, because if we shift to, I mean, an argument I would make is, hey, if you scroll back like 150 years, um, childhood was pretty fatal a lot. Like kids used to die of a lot of things. Um, and, and, and we were much better acquainted with death. Like people, people just died. Uh, tuberculosis, which was called consumption, right. which they tried to go to a sanatorium, but nobody really knew what caused it until they figured it out. Uh, like there were all and smallpox and mumps and measles and all that. Many of them were, were fatal, um, certainly polio uh, and a bunch of others. And, and we've slowly you know, chipped away and eradicated a lot of them, gotten rid of one or two. And we have no memory of that. Like, like, you know, that's a conversation I think is interesting, but it's still very much freighted about medicine and vaccines and, and how, isn't, isn't science great? Like, and I'm traveling back 150 years in time to try to get away from the, the present dilemma, but clearly I'm making an argument about the present dilemma in yeah. some sense, right? So I don't know how to, uh, I'm, I'm not expert in figuring out within the same domain how to find a safer space for the, for the topic, right? And I, I, I would love to, to have good advice on, on, on how to choose your way through that. Um, so I made friends recently with the author of the Book of Questions. Um, he wrote it back in 1987. His name is uh, Gregory Stock, Greg Stock, and very interesting guy. Uh, and he's figured out almost like an algorithm for asking interesting but sort of neutral questions. Meaning most of his questions come out not politically charged. 
And there's still questions you're interested in sitting down and answering. And some of them are just hypotheticals. If you were in this situation, you know, if you could live forever, but be poor versus blah, 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 which one would you choose? That kind of question. I love that. <clears throat> I, do, yeah. I do the same thing a lot when I um, start conversations. I think that's a great way to. Well, he's coming up with an app with a freemium app, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. So I've had that conversation a little bit with him. And, and, and he's, from my perception, not that interested in taking this into political realms. He's interested in this being useful for relationship establishment, trust creation, dating, whatever. Like, it's, you know, it's, it's really a useful dating instrument. It's like, hey, let's sit down and answer a couple of tough questions over, <laughs> over drinks. You know, that, that's interesting. Um, and I'm like, I'm somehow really interested in like, how do we take this into the hard conversations? Because, because we're we're faced with really difficult things right now, from pandemics to climate to to racism and whatnot. And unless we sort out how to get through them, they're going to sink us. Well, the reason I like, you know, what, what he's talking about for a first question mm -hmm. is everybody's going to take the question from their own perspective, and it it's a really good clue to see what somebody's needs are, where they're coming from. Exactly. And, and when there's questions like immortality or, you know, wealth or, or whatever on the table as part of the question, you hear what people think about, like, you know, I'm, I'm surprised I, a couple of times I've asked audiences like, okay, if you, if you could live to be 500 years old, but feel like you're 40, you know, you'd, you'd, be, you'd be pretty healthy unless you got run over by a truck. Um, who would do that? And like very few people want to live to 500 years. Very I few. <laughs> I would love to. I like put put me on that boat, like like I would love to do that. Um, yeah, it's a little bit like Groundhog Day, except you never get to repeat the day. <laughs> put you there forever. Oh man, that'd be a, that would be a lot of pain. <laughs> That's a, life is not always easy. That's a lot yeah. of well, and and I think, <laughs> I, I think the assumption I think the assumption is nobody else gets to live that long, so you wind up seeing all your friends live and die, live and die, live yeah. and die, right? That's, then that's clearly hard. Uh, mm -hmm. That's clearly hard. Um, so, yeah. But I, I understand, I mean, I, I, I do understand why you'd want to. It's similar to, you know, people would say, do you want to come back to the, you know, to reincarnate again? And there are times that I say, no way, I'm never coming back. I want to be done. And then there are other times that I say, you know what? Yes, I do. I want to I want to try again. And I, it would be fun to be something else. And depends. Give me a little do over. Come on, please. <laughs> Can I have the do over? Um, I know. Agreed. Um, so uh, again, the, yeah. big, the biggest issue and, you know, when he talks about questions and relationships, it's really undervalued how important relationships are in business, not just in relationship. On the ground level, people will go further for somebody that they're connected to. Obviously. And, yeah. you know, I feel like that gets overlooked a lot. Not with, see, the people that come to OGM, there's a greater concentration here of people that are really, I mean, I find there's a greater self-awareness here. And there's also a greater connectivity to the rest of the world. They see those connections. That's right. not to say that other groups don't, but there are certain groups that proportionally have a lot less of that. They are less trusting. They are more concerned with protecting themselves. They want to do good things. I'm not saying they're not kind, but it's really hard to do good things when you're always afraid somebody's going to take advantage of you. Exactly. So the relationship. Which, which which, which, which takes us back a little bit to your comments about money coming into a, a community or a conversation like this, which we can go back to as well. Um, so years ago, I moved from Manhattan out to San Francisco, like 1998, and I helped uh, Eric Greenberg start a company called Scient, which you may not remember, but Scient was one of the dot-com kind of like, they went public, their stock went spectacularly high, then they crashed hard later. Um, and I helped them create the, the initial pitch deck. And one of my little statements made it through the pitch deck. And it was like, um, transactions are the byproduct of successful relationships. Yeah. And that became a piece of their code, a piece of you know, how they approach projects. And I don't know how, I don't know whether it got baked into their methodology or whatnot. Um, 
but but and, and then in, in 2010, I started a thing called the Relationship Economy Expedition or Rex, uh, which if you go to LinkedIn, I still haven't sort of swapped over to, to OGM, but 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 I I was really irritated by visions of the attention economy and the experience economy specifically. Because in the attention economy, the idea is attention is our scarce resource. And so it's all about fighting over getting you know, somebody else's attention. And I'm like, you know, I have friends I haven't seen for a decade and I spend no time with them. They have no, none of my attention right now, but if they showed up tomorrow and said, I need some help, I would drop things and, and help them. Like they have all my, you know, all my loyalty and respect, right? Right. But the other way to look at that, I mean, I see the, the negative part of it, but the positive part of it is your attention is worth something. Right. These friends that you haven't seen for so long, you're dropping everything because they are of value to you. But not on a per minute basis. They're of value to me in my life. Yeah. Right. But, but I think and, the point I'm trying to make is, and I'm agreeing with you, I'm just yeah. looking at it a different yeah. way, is that you know these people that are designing software or whatever, they're trying to grab our attention at all costs. It doesn't matter if they turn us into zombies. There's not, they don't care about that. When we should be valuing our attention, we should be, they have to win our attention. Right. But there has to be, there's a reason they're getting our attention, like when, like Facebook. There's a reason so many people are on Facebook doing whatever they're doing. They're getting a need filled, whether they realize it or not. And that's that need to be heard. That's why I keep preaching the things that I do, because I'm where I would like to help those, I don't know, 70%, 80%. I don't know how much, what the percentage, but if we don't help them to find fulfillment, we're going to just, you know, eat each other. Right, I um, totally agree. I totally agree. Yeah, um, and, and, that's and storytelling is, you know, important, and exactly. having their stories heard. And I don't know, something has to shift in the. Um, I mean, I said this to you before, and I really mean this. The fourth estate should truly be owned by the people, mm -hmm. and that and that revenue should feed itself like that is the only I can't think of any other sustainable system other than by looking at our economy as an attention economy and seeing how we would make that flow um by which do you mean that we would reward writers of articles by how many people clicked on their article no well that's how an no. attention economy might work and I, I think that's it bad might for, work I think, that I think that, that's bad for journalism I agree, and it might work that way. Yeah. But like, all right. So part of Shimon's project, and I don't understand the whole thing, you know, you know, especially like you know the plat the tech stuff. Yeah. But if we, if the people were actually creating it, then it's their work product that's being created. Right. And then that's a different way. I mean, I mean, he, I'm not, he doesn't talk anything about charging that. I'm not. I don't mean to draw that parallel. I'm just talking in terms of if the people are creating something, then the people are getting paid for it. Like, yeah. for example, let's just make it up and say that Facebook was selling, like, let's say Facebook charged, or no, that doesn't work either. People, well, they don't, they do do it that way. I always felt that Facebook should like pay the New York Times and then the New York Times should be given to us for free. That mm -hmm. would be our payment for our attention. That's that, that type of a... And, and I think, I think a Facebook and or Google are making some small payments to some media, some news enterprises, but I've forgotten who and how much, but that kind of came across the radar pretty shockingly recently. I don't think that, you know, that, that hasn't been going on for long, but I think they were trying to do some of that because, because they're realizing, you know, and Craigslist kind of, um, Craigslist kicked one of the legs out from under journalism, which is part of the reason why Craig Newmark funds a lot of journalism uh, research and, and other kinds of things at this point. At least I think there's a causal relationship there because classify Can you explain that? Sure. How so, you so, legs? So, um, so newspapers used to make money from advertisements, classifieds, and subscriptions. 
those are the three legs of their of their stool mostly, right? Um, and the adver basically the 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 classifieds got nuked by Craigslist. Okay, yes. Because right. Craigslist Craigslist is basically self service free uh, classifieds, right? And for you know for your locality with 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 much better search than newspapers right. were able to provide. Uh, with, and, and, and you didn't have to sit down and talk to an operator who was going to misspell your entry and you weren't being charged by the syllable or the character and like all that stuff was like terrific. Now I understand. Um, and, and so there, there goes a third of newspapers revenue, right? Uh, and then, and then advertising winds up becoming web advertising and they're still struggling with that. And, and there are publications where I land on their page to try to read an article and there are 50 things that invade the, the page. And I'm just like irritated and angry at them. And, and, and even some places where I pay subscriptions, they still put a whole bunch of, and I'm like, no, 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 I'm paying you money so that you stop putting those things in so that I can actually read the content that I think you allege to be interested in showing me. Right. Anyway, <laughs> um, and then subscriptions have died a lot. Although, uh, although during times like Trump, you know, subscriptions shot way up. You know, I, I think, I think, Trump becoming uh, president in 2016 uh, was great for the New York Times digital subscriptions. Like their subscriptions shot up like crazy. Uh, and, and, and this is a side conversation, but it's sort of interesting in terms of the attention economy. Trump understood that CNN and everybody else could not turn off their lens from him. That they were benefiting from showing the circus he was putting on. And he made sure that the circus was always right out at the edge of what was mm -hmm. possible and never too far. Weirdly, I don't understand. He has this, he has some sense of the instinct of what would be a, like a step too far. He could, he could say, I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and nobody will, you know, everybody would be fine, but he didn't go and try to shoot somebody in the middle of Fifth Avenue. That's probably good. Um, but, but he had a, a real, I think, sense of where that boundary was. And he was always pushing that boundary because we get used to the last thing. It's like, well, Okay, so he did that. So you can't do that again. And the next thing has to escalate a little bit or he doesn't get the attention, you know, that dynamic. And that's all about attention and the attention economy. And arguably, arguably he became president because he understood those dynamics better than anybody else, right? And on, on my wish list of things that had happened in the past, uh, during one of the debates between Clinton and, and uh, Trump, uh, I, I wish that Jeff Zucker, who was in charge of CNN News, turned the cameras on me and had st stared at the camera and said, my friends, we've been hacked. I don't mean, and I don't mean that Chinese or Russian hackers are in our servers, which they probably are. What I mean is the man we're showing you has figured out how to use us against you. And until we figure this out better, we're going to show you a lot less of him. Yeah. And they, 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 I don't know that it was even possible maybe for them to do that, but they could have done that. Right. And if they had sat, if they had sat back and stopped giving him the oxygen, maybe the fire wouldn't have burned so bright. Yeah. Well, you're absolutely right about, about him in terms of he is really good at lighting the match and walking away. He's a fire ship. He's like, um, do you know what a fire ship is? No. So it's, you'd have like fleets sail next to each other and try to shoot each other with cannon. One of the right tactics was you take an old ship, one, that, one that's like creaky and old, you Fire load ship. it up with turpentine and, and everything flammable you push it, you, you, you set sail and you shove it toward where the, the, where the fleet is thickest and you set it on fire. Uh, yeah. And sometimes people like sail it close and then they jump overboard and swim back to the fleet kind of thing. Um, yeah, Trump was kind of a fire ship for democracy. In, in, in that and he was an expert at reality TV. So he really understands people's motivations and he really knows who he can put together to most likely get the desired effect. And exactly. uh, yeah, yeah, no, so, I see. So, so we've gone into sort of dark, darker waters, but um, but how much could it cost to have a reasonable layer of journalists funded well across the country? Really, like considering how much we pay for traveling, um, which I hope we never have to use, uh, why isn't there a service core, right, of journalists that are, that, going back to what you said, why, why are they not subsidized, supported by the government in some sense? Right. And the other thing I want to say is the reason that Trump was able to orchestrate this is that he really understands a lot about human behavior, but particularly about the 80% the of the people, the people that aren't doing big things and the great things. 
And how could we take that same knowledge? Because basically they want to be respected. Mm -hmm. They want to be valued. He made them feel that. How do we take that same, that same knowledge about what they're looking for? And as Howard Thurman says, help people to come alive. And there are a lot of very smart people out there. And that's why I keep going back to Facebook. If they were supported to co-create an accurate reporting type thing, and that's what I mean when I keep saying people running the fourth estate, people becoming the fourth estate, owning the fourth estate. And what I like, like maybe Shimon's project is going towards that. I don't know, but that's what, that's what sparked my interest in wanting to know more. Um, Agreed. Um... And a piece of what I'm hoping OGM does is help tease out people like Howard Thurman and a bunch of others who've got really great ideas, make their ideas more popular, weave those ideas into the common knowledge of what we know. Like, like we, don't, we don't have a place, we've got Wikipedia, which is kind of mostly facts and stuff, right? Um, and then we've got Google, which everybody turns to for search, which kind of won the search wars. And we don't have a lot else in terms of a structure of what we know. We just, not a lot, there's, there's like the blogosphere and the Twitterverse, and that's good, but those are, those are like pouring past us all the time. They don't really like make a, a, a context uh, for doing stuff. So how can we weave that context so that these great ideas get put to work? I think we have to start looking at projects and add that to the rubric of how successful a plan is because a lot of people are very well intentioned, but there still seems to be a split between what we have to do and we're pragmatic and we need to make money and we need to do this. And yes, and we want to uplift people and we want to nurture them. That, that one's secondary. That one, we'll do that after we get here. And it doesn't work that way. It has to work together. Yeah. So maybe there has to be a little bit of looking at, well, what are our goals? You, you know, mean, so you mean for OGM or you mean as a society in general, in, yeah, in general, in general, you know, I mean, we've been taught like the most efficient method, you know, we want less people. What about if we switched that? What if we said something is more successful, the more people we need to do it, right. you know, um, and that's oh. where what's go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I was interrupting you. Go ahead. Uh, when Scott mentions breaking things down into pieces, mm -hmm. I think that's, that also is good for many reasons, one of which being it helps other people contribute in little ways just to feel part of a whole. Because yeah. feeling like you're part of a whole is really, really, really important. And it's not a yes, but. If we really agree it's important, then we really have to make an effort to make that happen. So feeling part of a whole is like central here, I think. And, and for example, um, I think that there's a bunch of people behind the curtain on the alt-right, the far right, who are busy doing crazy high fives and cheering each other when, when Joe Bob's Pepe the Frog gif goes viral and really pisses off those liberals and makes the liberals cry. Like, like whoever, whoever's gif won the day that day is feeling really good and feeling a sense of community they didn't have before this thing materialized for them. So, so for me, a huge reason why a bunch of people have banded together to do this insurgency, and I think of the alt-right as an insurgency that, that understands a lot of the dynamics of how media work, how power works, all those kinds of things. And they're busy pulling up on those levers with all their might, with all their might, while the left is like, Hey, there's social justice. Hey, the planet's on fire. Hey, we've got 50 different issues, all of which are really important, but the left doesn't really pull on the levers in unison much. It doesn't know how, right? And, and so when you get everybody unified, even if you're a minority, um, you can actually sort of win power. And that's, that's what seems to have happened. That's where we are right now. We're in this weird, weird position. But this feeling of belonging is super important. Have you ever heard me tell the story of Black September? So Yasser Arafat was the head of the PLO, the people, the, the, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Um, he was getting no attention. And then the PLO pulled off the Munich Olympics uh, uh, kidnappings of the Israeli athletes in 1972, which turns into the helicopters blowing up and is a, is a real disaster. 
and he's got 300 trained kind of ter terrorist guerrillas in this in this Black September organization. That's what they ended up being called. Well, that incident gets Yasser invited to the negotiating table, and all of a sudden Yasser kind of has what he wants, which is he's 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 being invited. So he doesn't really want terrorist incidents to happen right now, but he's got 300 trained killers who are just like thirsty to go out and do some damage. So what do they do? They put out a call across the Arab Crescent and they say, young women of the Arab Crescent, the chairman needs you. He creates a dating game for these terrorists, marries them off, gives, oh them a, gives them a bonus if they get married, gives them a bonus if they have a child, they'll get a TV, they'll get a flat, they'll get an extra five grand or something. I don't know what it was. But he basically successfully melts an, a, an organization of, of 300 terrorists. And then he, they test them a decade later they test these guys by offering them um, assistant ambassador or something or other ships around the world. Like you can have this, this notable position that's paid well in another country, but all of these guys know that their names are on lists and if they leave the country, they're gonna be arrested and spend the rest of their lives in jail. So none of them accept these, these nice positions because they don't wanna lose their families, right? So, so a ton of this, a ton of this, I think is about community and then a ton of it is about how we see our future if we think our future is going to be crappy and we're, you know if we think our kids future is going to be crappier than we than ours and then our grandparents we're going to be willing to break a lot of things or do a lot of dangerous things to try to not have that happen well again so i'm drawing the parallel between the people on facebook especially the people that are on the right that are yelling the loudest and just looking to fight over anything yep if the way um, Arafat gave them another road to take, we gave them another road to use those same skills. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and and so so one of the one of the projects that's starting to grow up and become a thing right now is Klaus Mager's food systems redesign project. Um, and we've had a couple of really good calls and stuff and planning over the last couple of days. Uh, and so I think that's going to turn into a regular weekly call and some project plans and a website and an initiative. And a piece of sort of the, the center idea for him is this, uh, this notion of uh, innovation brokers who go into farming communities because his project is about regenerative agriculture. Uh, it's not about revitalizing cities or other things. And there are plenty of things broken, you know, in, in towns across the country and across the world. But he's focused on regenerative agriculture. So he wants to send innovation brokers who understand resources, methods, uh, whatever, and can sit and tell stories and, and then make connections for people on the ground in different settings. Awesome. There could easily be a service core, you know, just like there's a, you know, Vista or a Peace Corps or you name it. There's, there's several really, really lovely and interesting uh, service cores. Uh, there could be a service core for regenerative agriculture. Um, and it could have funding, you know, there could be stipends, there could be whatever. And, and the resource base that these people draw on and feed could be very OGME in the sense of, you know, uh, it could be linked, it could be open, it could be available. And wherever there's controversy, we could figure out how to unpack the controversy and like test experiments and whatever else. And, 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 and I'm, I'm hopeful about that. I think that that's really interesting. And then I look up and I'm like, well, okay, and then Monsanto is going to do what? Because because Monsanto's decided that the you know science is the way forward, and we're going to we're going to put a gene into seeds so they don't actually germinate and replicate again, which I think is a crime against humanity. Personally, um, we're going to make sure we're going to we're going to breed some of our crops so that they're resistant to the pesticides we sell, which it turns out some bugs are already immune to anyway. Like, like, like we're getting super bugs because this whole cycle just runs, you know, nature finds a way as, as Jeff Goldblum so famously says in Jurassic Park. <laughs> um, and, and, and so that's gonna happen at the same time as Klaus is out here trying to stand up some innovation brokers. So let's stand up the innovation brokers and see if we can not help people find a way um, to do this. And, um, and, and the reality of the political battles and the corporate battles is just reality. That's just like, that's just the super in right now. Um, and if we can find a way to diffuse that energy, and I mean both, it's funny, I mean both defuse to remove the fuse, but also diffuse in the sense of dissipate, right? If we can find a way to defuse and defu diffuse that energy um, and or convert it, transform it into, hey, that sounds like a good idea. I think I'll go along with this and we're gonna make some money from doing this, right? 
But it's, uh, I heard Al Gore speak in front of a crowd like 10 years ago, I think. <clears throat> and his first statement was, I don't understand why conservatives don't see greening the economy as a huge economic opportunity. I don't get why they won't say, wow, that sounds like a lot of good business. And Biden ran on green business. Like the, this is gonna be the green economy where this is all about jobs, 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 right? Because he knew it wasn't about the peace, Nick, save the earth stuff because no conservative, nobody in the middle was gonna vote for that. Um, so, so there's this really like weird, dangerous, inter interesting moment that we're in where if we can figure out how to save the fourth estate and have them report in, in a way that's credible, if we can figure out how to get people who have, who are credible and can build trust and have access to, to really great stories and knowledge and resources, if we can figure out how to help wealthy, there's a lot of money sloshing around that doesn't know what to do. If we can get a bunch of that money into pools of responsible investment, that's interesting, right? I think the idea of, I mean, I think I mentioned it before, like the Truth and Justice podcast. I think the idea of sort of leading people or guiding or sending them out on a mission to find the truth and using that sense of play. Again, I'm focused on the 80%. Yeah. You know, I'm focused on the people on Facebook to be able to get them engaged in finding answers because then they're working together and i've seen it happen and it, it's incredible the same with you know when we talk about um Klaus's project and i say if if you had the lesson plan so that the kids were going home and doing their own community mapping and talking to their parents and oh yeah the community garden right down the street and then you know you're, you're building that social fabric so that people want to become involved um yeah i think that's that's a huge part of it i this weekend i was up in woodstock new york and i was talking oh, to cool. somebody who what he does is he starts community gardens that's what he does that's what he does for fun and uh yeah i'd like you I mean yeah this is like such a great uh, i'm really happy that this is the project that we're getting to watch unfold and I think there's a storytelling component in that too. You absolutely, know, we should, absolutely. And I, I hope that doesn't get, you know, I hope that doesn't get lost and it really gets documented. Actually, the good news is that there's a bunch of good stories about this, like the biggest little farm and a bunch of sort of nice mini documentaries. There's a whole about soil fertility. There, there's a lot of good video to watch, alas, um, on this topic. But I'm really interested, though, in finding the people that were able to start something without any help that yeah. had to do it. You know, that's what I'm interested in. Your everyday person that figured out a way to do it. Those are the stories that if we can tell, we empower other people to do the same. And connect Agreed. those stories. Yeah, yeah. So can you say more about that? Like, do you know any any instances or are you just saying like you want to hear more of them? Um, I don't know enough to be able to go into detail. I know like in Nyack where I live, I know the businesses work with the farmers, you know, the local farmers. I don't know enough of the detail about it. I do know that when I went to sign up to work in my community garden, there's a waiting list like you can't believe. Yeah, um, yeah. And even uh, I remember the high school that my son went to, and I'm to, this particular son is an, an angry kind of kid, but he really benefited from working in the garden, you know, and I'd like to see, I, I'd like to see the mental wellness component tied in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's just super critical. Um, let me scroll back a second about the waiting list for community gardens. So, what that means to me is that there's a lot of demand for community garden, either for working in it and digging around in it, making a piece of the, uh, you know, having your own plot, or just for produce and you know veggies off off the off the plot. But I'm assuming it's people who wanted to create their own plot inside the community garden. Correct. And I'm assuming that there's empty plots around. No. <laughs> there's no there's no land to make other community gardens on. I, I, I mean, again, like I said, I don't know enough to go into it. But yeah. no, I don't, I don't think there are. Oh, that's weird. I mean, like in a city like Detroit, 
some one third of the housing stock has just been raised because it was so damaged and that, like they're, they're systematically taking it down. So in a place like Detroit, there's a lot of land you could turn into, um, assuming you can remediate the land, but probably these are probably not super fun sites that was just a house, right? Um, right. Uh, so, so there's a lot of places to do that, but I guess, and you, are you talking specifically Nyack or, or like? Well, I've only checked in Nyack because yeah. that's where I lived. And I said, well, let me find out. Um, yeah. I know, actually, now that I'm thinking about it, there is one in New City, it's a cooperative. Mm -hmm. you, so you, it's, you pay in and then you, um, I do believe you work and you get a certain amount back. Uh, I think it's like a few hundred dollars that you pay for your vegetables. So it's more like right. a cooperative. Which is a different model altogether. Yeah, but, but still same sort of same sort of work, but, but everybody sort of picks a role and does larger scale work. You know, right. And if you don't have the five hundred dollars to join the cooperative, then you're out of luck. Right. Uh, and maybe there's ways of financing people in through sweat equity or through through other kinds of financing or small loans or whatever to, to get into the co-ops. Um, don't know. Uh, so. So I, partly I'm asking that because I hear about like there's waiting lists for really good schools. Like why? Why are good schools scarce? And I'm not, a, I think, you know, I'm not a big fan of schools with a capital S, period. And for me, learning should be inexpensive and, and easily accessible anywhere on earth. Um, and we should band together. I don't mean that we shouldn't get together to learn. I think learning is a social event, <clears throat> but there's no reason to militarize the whole thing and to make sure that, you know, only kids within eight, six months of each other, you know, are in the same room kind of things like, seriously, people, why are we doing that? Um, so why are there waiting lists for the scarce resources called community gardens and good schools? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think there need to be. I think it's dumb that 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 that's the world we're in, right? Yeah. Well, as far as school, I mean, with schools, I actually think we should have trained facilitators and moderators. And the lessons should be created by the very best. I mean, like I sit here, I watch like. YouTube videos of like Robert Sapolsky and I'm loving it. Yeah. You know, why not have the best create the video material and then teach people to facilitate and moderate that are that are qualified. Not, I mean, you know, I taught school when I was when I was in my early 20s, I taught in New York City. And I came in and I was like so excited. I loved being with the kids. Mm -hmm. And some of the teachers, I they were old and bitter. Yeah, yeah. And they truly looked at the kids as animals. Yeah. How can you be taught like that? And it, yeah. it was very hard on a young teacher because God forbid you want to try something your own way. I know. Because you don't I want know. to be mean and bitter. So I think the whole school system should change. Um, are you familiar with John Taylor Gatto? No. Okay. So do not pass go, do not collect $200. Um, uh, take a look at, let me just give you, uh, uh, there's a website for the, uh, my favorite book of his, which is the underground history of American education. Okay. Um, and so there's a website where you can read the book for free. Uh, you can also, uh, buy the book on paperback only, I think. Um, uh, so he was one of my openings into half of my theories of how the world works. So design from trust and all those kinds of things really are spill outs from some 30 years ago. I can actually tell you when. Come on, little brain, don't work so slowly. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -da. Sorry, I got to find a couple of things here to send you links on the chat. Here's the name of the yeah, book. Same chat. <laughs> yeah, um, let me give you, here's the name of the book. Uh, here's a link to the book on Amazon in case you want to buy it. Boop, 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 boop. Uh, here is this spot in my brain, which is, I think, totally worth navigating around. Uh, and then, uh, ba -da -ba -da. oh, I think actually, I think this is a YouTube uh, video where somebody read the whole book, I think. I'm not I sure. I like that. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if it's still there, but it's in my brain as that, if you want to check that out and see if that actually yeah. leads to that. And then I know that the book is available online. I'm trying to figure out which one of these it is. Anyway, um, he has a lot of really, really, really interesting stuff. Uh, and he, he was a New York high school teacher. Um, so in fact, he was getting a lot of awards 
for his teaching. So they started sending people in to observe his classrooms. And it turns out that the way he was winning awards was he was breaking all the rules of school. Um, so, so in the book, he talks about what, what we now think, think about as the hidden curriculum of schooling. And the hidden curriculum is, the, the explicit curriculum is, I'm supposed to be trying to teach you math or English or, or French. Um, the hidden curriculum is, when the bell rings, you're supposed to put down everything and go to the next class. And I really don't care if you were in the flow. Like it's immaterial. Like, like there, nobody cares if you were like jamming on the poem and whatever. There is no room for that because you're just a little cog in the wheel. So your job here is to learn how to be a little cog in the giant machine that is the economy. Uh, when, you know, I am God in the classroom, I can put a mark on your record that will screw up your life for a long time. Uh, there's a whole bunch of, you know, you will be evaluated by people who will never meet you, who've written these arbitrary tests that I have to give you, all this kind of crap of the, of the hidden curriculum of schooling. And he makes that, he makes that visible. And, and I have a whole trope I can say about the hidden architectures of mistrust. So design from trust implies that we've been designing for mistrust. And yes, we have. And we have because we lost faith in humans somewhere along the road and we decided to build these large institutions because there's so many people and we had to build them in kind of coercive ways because otherwise people won't behave right. And that assumption underlies almost all the institutions we have. And I'm trying to say, if we did the opposite, if we started like Wikipedia does by assuming good intent and then figured out how to deal with the bad actors late and cleverly, we might have very, 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 very different systems now. Right. And so I'm, I'm sort of saying this about every system, but the door opened for me around Gatto and, and, and Doc Searles sent me an essay by Gatto called The Six Lesson School Teacher. I'll send you a link to that as well. The Six Lesson School Teacher was kind of my doorway in. And I'm like, oh, holy crap, this is really interesting. Um, my brain is moving very slowly. I think my machine is very confused right now. There we go. Um, <laughs> doo, 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 doo. Where to go? I need to search for it with the now slow search function. Um, so the sixth lesson school teacher was a short essay in the Sun, which was a you know reader submitted uh, journal, um, and it just like woke me up. And I'm like, whoa, that's that's really really interesting. <clears throat> okay, good. So I think I've got it. Uh, my brain's got to stop beach balling. There we go. But, Copy finally, and now I can paste it into the chat. Okay, um, so that's the six lesson school teacher later rewritten to include seven, eight, maybe even nine lessons. But but this is sort of the the start of this notion of the hidden curriculum. Um, and so a piece of what he says in the underground history is that American educators went to Germany, and they witnessed the Prussian military school system that had been set up for Bismarck to create a docile layer of well-educated and kind of prosperous people that would be fans of, of Bismarck so that he could control power. Our educators copied that system and dropped it in and, and they, they dropped it in into 12 experimental schools in Manhattan the first year. And I'm making up the numbers and I don't remember what year. At the end of that year, there were riots in the streets where horse mounted police injured parents and children who were picketing saying, this is a terrible system. We don't want the system. The next year, the system was rolled out across the whole Manhattan, the whole uh, New York public school system. And then the system gets rolled out across the country, including in Gary, Indiana. I'm remembering there was like, cause Gary was a company town. So there was there, 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 a lot of this was, was, was experimented with in Gary, Indiana and then flowed across the country from there. And we basically took hundreds of thousands of little one-room schoolhouses that were doing a fine job of educating Americans and, and American citizens, and we industrialized the whole thing. So then you get these, I went, I went to Marina High School in Huntington Beach, California, where there were 4,000 kids. I was one of 995 in my graduating class. And I graduated a year ahead of my normal buddies. So I knew two people in my graduating class. Mm. That was it. Right? And I have no contact with anybody from, from that school. It was like a big industrial school. Um, and so this has happened all around our society, right? And now we're trying to hit undo or redo or reinvent or something, but all this stuff is buried really, really deep. 
like well, you hit on seriously. something when you said, well, first of all, docile, you know, the word docile just jumped out at me. And the citizenship part, we're, we're not teaching citizens. We don't, we don't want to teach that. We want you to be, not we, <laughs> the system is set up to keep you docile. Yes. Um, I worked at, uh, I did an internship at the Dalton School in Manhattan. And that was, oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, that was, that was wonderful. And it was totally the opposite of what we're talking about. It was just providing the materials and letting the kids find their interests and let them discover what worked. I remember we made bridges out of like toilet paper rolls. We learned about tension and we, I mean, it was, and it was always, well, what do you think? You know, they'd come to you with a question. Well, what do you think? Okay, let's try it. Let's see. You know, it's like, yep. it's actually valuing making mistakes. So you don't look at a mistake as a mistake. You look at a mistake as an experiment. As a learning event. Yeah. So the last link I just put on here is to my TEDx talk, which is all about education. I don't know if you've ever seen that. No. Okay. Great. Okay. So let me give you another talk because if you like that one. I, I like YouTube videos. I, I prefer that. I, I, I have no, my brain can't read anymore. It's really hard. I finally got through a book because I had to. Yeah. So I like this better. <laughs> and the six lesson school teachers are relatively short essay. So that hopefully that, that doesn't give you trouble. But the last two YouTube links I put on, I put in there. One of them is my TEDx talk in 2012. And the other one I did for the Las Vegas downtown project, like six or eight months later. And it's, it's a follow on. So I basically build on what I did in the first talk. And they're both only about education. Oh, great. Um, and I've forgotten that you'd done a bunch of teaching and all that. So you might, you might like them. And a lot of the things that OGMiness sort of comes from have roots in these, in these talks, because it's, it's all about trust, how to regain trust, uh, all those sorts of things. Yeah, great. Um, and then let me give you another link while we're at it. Um, uh, I did a video which was meant to be a draft, uh, just I think during lockdown. Um, here we go. And so it's not well produced and it's just me sitting in a chair talking about it. Um, but, and I'd love to deepen it, elaborate it, produce it, do more with it. Uh, but let me send you that link also. It's basically how I see the world, like what happened to trust. Um, and, and I think I have a sort of an unusual thesis that, you know, uh, it accords with some people who've influenced how I see the world who are kind of non-standard thinkers. Did you put it in? Yes. There should be a last YouTube link in the chat. The one that ends with P5C. Okay. Let me save that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. So that'll keep you busy on YouTube for a while. Yeah, like well, them. thank you. This, this was, I'm shocked that nobody showed up, but I enjoyed the time. <laughs> Me too, entirely, entirely. Um, yeah, and you've got me thinking about a bunch of stuff. Um, so, so let's pour some energy into Klaus's project and like uh, breathe it into being a thing and help him out. Um, Jordan, who's been helping me with create sort of, and a bunch of others create OGM and Massive and a bunch of other things. He's behind, uh, he's also trying to help Klaus a lot. So uh, I think we have a lot of resources to work with. Yeah. And figure out how to do this. Sounds good. So we ready? Shall we I'm fold gonna... our call? Yeah, I think so. I'm sure you have stuff that you need to do. <laughs> Um, this this actually works better in my day, um, having because I have a little transit time. I have, I have a desk I can use nearby, and this gives me actually time between calls to transit. So that's great. It was nice That'll talking to you. Thank I you will so see much. you next week. Same here. Thanks, Stacy. Bye. -bye. Bye.